let's move forward a bit in time. A lot happened during the period from the 1906 election, where Labour won 29 seats and formally became the Labour Party, to the 1923 election, where Labour won 191 seats and formed their first government under Ramsay MacDonald. Notable for our purposes are the years 1914 to 1918. World War One, though known by many as a war sparked by the death of Archduke Franz Ferdinand, was ultimately the result of the imperialist tensions that had begun to build. It came forth from competition between the powers of Europe to redivide a freshly partitioned earth with the lives of workers damned to be chits for expansion. In the words of Rosa Luxemburg, profits are springing like weeds from the field of the dead. So how did Labour react to war? Well, I mentioned Benjamin Tillett before, and his attitude was indicative of the parties. Prior to 1914, he supported an international general strike in the face of war. However, by the time war came around, he said in one 1917 pamphlet, Despite our former pacifist attitude, the forces of Labour in England have supported the government throughout the war. We realise that this is a fight for world freedom against a carefully engineered plan to establish a world autocracy. As well as another instance saying, in a strike, I inform my class, right or wrong. In a war, I inform my country, right or wrong. Say what you want about Tillett, and I certainly could say a lot about the man, but he has just put the folly of social democracy in such a succinct uh, set of words Completely by accident, well, I mean, fair play. Social democracy is ultimately more a form of liberalism than socialism, taking the individualist division encouraged by liberalism and adapting it to the globe. Our workers will see welfare. The workers of the world will see war. This must be the attitude of those who seek not the destruction of capitalism, but reconciliation with it, allowing its endless hunger for more growth and more profit to further ravage the earth. Modern parallels are very apparent. The foremost social democrats in the US, Bernie Sanders and AOC, hold imperialist views toward the rest of the world whilst supporting work power at home, or claiming to anyway. The same goes for social democratic parties the world over, and we'll see this mindset be that of Labour time and time again. Labour MPs and union officials helped recruit young cannon fodder for the war effort and drove efforts to raise production. I said efforts twice, I don't know why I did that. Pacifists in the party were hounded and mocked, and even in areas where pacifism was present, such as in the ILP, with affiliated with the party in 1906, this desire for peace was on shaky ground. Ramsay MacDonald, for instance, said in a 1914 common speech in response to the Foreign Secretary, We will offer him ourselves if the country is in danger, but he has not persuaded me that it is. Oh, that's, exact, that's how Ramsay MacDonald sounds, I've decided. Uh, MacDonald's anti-war position was based only in this belief that war would be bad for the British state. On the topic of MacDonald, we'll be returning to him in a short moment. However, there's a second event in this World War I period that shook the world to its core. 1917. This was the year that Labour was forced to massively adapt their political inclination towards something resembling socialism, though indeed not socialism itself. This year saw a huge rise in worker militancy that became a theme during the war. By the end of the war, trade union membership rose in Britain to 6.5 million, with an annual figure of 6 million working days lost per year through strikes. On a far larger scale were the main events of 1917, the two Russian revolutions, one in February and one in October, the latter serving as the beginning of the Soviet Union and the world's first socialist experiment, or second if you count the Paris Commune. In February 1917, MacDonald paid tribute to the first of these revolutions and held it as an example of workers taking initiative. Arthur Henderson called for councils of workers and soldiers to be set up in Britain to ensure emancipation before leading the charge to try and reboot Labour into something a bit more socialist-y sounding. At least. However, such attitudes weren't to stand, or were for certain nature of you more cynical, for Henderson's efforts to remake Labour were born not from the joy of revolt, but in fear of it. In visiting Russia in May of 1917 to try and rile up its people for the war effort, he saw reformists brought into government, but also saw the growing influence of the Bolsheviks. His apartment was ransacked by Leninists trying to discern whether he really was a socialist leader or at all the British government, reporting that many workers there wanted to place directors and managers in a subordinate position and the supreme control in the hands of the working people themselves. It can only have results that will be a disaster. This horror was further suggested by his January 1918 pamphlet, The Aims of Labour, wherein he stated, Revolution is a word of evil omen. It calls up visions of barricades in the streets and blood in the gutters. No responsible person, whether determined he or she may be to effect a complete transformation of society, can contemplate such a possibility without horror. To the British people in particular, the prospect of a period of convulsive efforts of this character is only without appeal. Revolution in this sense is alien to the British character. 
It would seem revolution was still an un-English phrase for Labour. To make this sweeping change to the party, the 1918 constitution came in to finally give Labour some semblance of direction. With this constitution came Clause 4, which read, to secure for the workers by hand or by brain the full fruits of their industry and the most equitable distribution thereof that may be possible upon the basis of the common ownership of the means of production, distribution and exchange, and the best obtainable system of popular administration and control of each industry or service. It may have been a means to stave off that revolution so feared by Henderson and Webb, but it was still something. It was still distinct from the liberal ideas that Labour had been entirely fueled by for its history up to this point. Among all the rot, all the patriotism, imperialism, revisionism and theoretical mangling stands this solitary beacon of genuine socialistic principle within the party's fabric. However, writing something in a constitution is a different beast to following that constitution, as would be seen with what is the main event of this section. It's time to talk about 1924 and Labour's first government. After incumbent Stanley Baldwin's calling of an election backfired, 1923 saw a hung parliament with 258 seats for the Conservatives, 191 for Labour and 158 for the Liberals. The Liberals, as kingmakers, decided to support Labour because of their disdain for Baldwin and because they thought allowing Labour to take the reins of government would show them to be incapable. Labour formed the government with Ramsay MacDonald as its PM, something undeniably historical despite the government's short nine month tenure. As J.R. Clines put it, an engine driver rose to the rank of colonial secretary. A starveling clerk became Great Britain's premier. A foundry hand was changed to foreign secretary. The son of a Kylie Weaver who was chancellor of the Exchequer. Stirring stuff. But, wait, hang on, what was that about colonial secretary? Oh yes, this is the Labour Party after all. Kissing up to reactionary institutions is the name of the game. MacDonald was fiercely reverent towards the military, saying that he'd dare not place a mere commoner and a socialist. I don't, think, I don't think that's the same accent as before. I think I might have changed that accidentally. In charge of the King's Navy. He instead opted to place one of he instead opted to place one of the several Tory ministers that he appointed to the cabinet in the position. The new colonial secretary concurred, saying, I'm here to say that there's no mocking about with the British Empire. MacDonald equally spent a great deal of time apologising to the King over Labour members singing the Red Flag, Labour's anthem. The admittedly stirring piece has received acclaim from the socialists the world over, with even Lenin awarding the writer of the song, Jim Connell, a Red Star Medal. However, MacDonald at once threw it under the bus to bow before royalty. It's not that Labour couldn't do anything about its institutions, they very well may not have been able to do anything about them, yes, but they actively admired them, that's the thing, they actively showed reverence towards them. Their untrammeled patriotism and traditionalism had carried through to their time in government unscathed. On the material side, there also wasn't much. The cabinet weaponised their TUC connections to enforce settlements in union disputes and mass recruited scabs to break strikes. In addition, Snowden, taking the role of Chancellor, essentially wrote up a Tory budget with him describing his fellow ministers as ravenous wolves. John Wheatley did manage to slip the Housing Act through the cracks, however, something that would result in the construction of 521,700 houses up to 1933. The nine months weren't all more of the same, after all, with the government also increasing pensions and unemployment benefits. Despite these good measures, a lack of commitment to change remained sequestered within them. Wheatley highlighted this in his speech amidst his Housing Act passing, saying, as the protector of the small builder, I'm the defender of private enterprise and one of its best friends. It requires labour proposals, socialist proposals if you like, and all that private enterprise can get going again. Suggestion that socialist proposals are some sort of miracle fuel that can get private enterprise going again is a contradiction in terms. Labour is still the party that believes putting toll bars on bridges is socialistic action. In the end, the government was brought down by a manufactured conspiracy about a letter from the Comintern president that was discovered, I'm, I'm making air quotes, you can't see it but I'm making air quotes, by the Secret Service. MacDonald dug his own grave even further by his overzealous defence and his not pointing out that the piece was a clear forgery. This led to their defeat in the October 1924 election, losing 40 seats despite gaining 1.1 million votes. Thank you very much, first past the post system. So what did Labour's first government show? While short, it demonstrated how the party had no backbone behind their socialist beliefs, socialistic beliefs, when push came to shove. Labour had always been patriotic, revisionist, reactionary, imperialist, etc., and remained all these things when in office. However, most importantly, this government served as an omen of the oncoming social democratic wave with the post-war consensus. 
This government would be the turning point. Well, not the deciding election that buried the Liberal Party, October 1924 saw them plummet another 42 seats down. Such a fall would be the beginning of the end for their time as the opposition to the Conservatives. Labour served as a far better opposition for the ruling class. Not only do they maintain the image of opposition when there is none, but their aesthetics proved to be far better in sating the working class. Labour, and the post-war consensus that would follow and include it, was a concerted effort in hegemonising the look and words of worker power, by positioning itself as a socialist entity, where it is really just a liberal party that is a bit better at sating the underclass. Class consciousness has become utterly mangled in Britain with words like socialism becoming obscured behind misdirection. Labour in government has done what social democratic parties always do dividing more evenly the spoils of imperialism to sate the domestic workforce and avoid socialist revolution. 